This week we are reviewing the Italian red varietal known as the King of Wines. And in this tip of the week, we are going to talk about the textbook food and wine pairings. All of that coming up next. Hello and welcome to Wine This Week with Scott Leak. If you like big, bold, expressive, structured red wines, this episode's for you. We're talking about the grape known as Nebbiolo, and it is most commonly known for a couple of regions that it's predominantly grown in Italy, Barolo and Barbaresco. Now you can find Nebbiolo in other places. It is predominantly an Italian wine, but you can find it in Australia, in Washington, in California. You can even find it being grown in Mexico. But for the most part, 90% of the production in the world comes from the Piedmont region in Italy. Within Piedmont, the Lange is kind of a sub-region where a lot of the wines are grown, or one of the grapes are grown. This one that we're tasting today is actually just a Lange. Inside the Lange are two very known, very well-known regions of Barolo and Barbaresco. And Barolo tends to be very strong, kind of a muscular, powerful wine. Barbaresco, a little bit lighter and more elegant, but these are still high tannin, high acid wines that need a lot of time to age. These can be pretty expensive wines as well because of those factors, because they grow, uh, they need south facing slopes. They're kind of hard to grow and uh, they have high aging requirements. Barolo and Barbaresco in particular have long aging requirements. The Lange Nebbiolo that I'm having today is 2016. This is still pretty young. So I actually opened this a while ago and it has been sitting in the glass, just getting a little aeration going for the last couple of hours. The other thing you'll notice about that glass is that I'm using a Pinot Noir glass today. Nebbiolo tends to be very terroir expressive. And I described that term in a little bit more detail in the tip of the week a few weeks ago. Basically, wherever you grow Nebbiolo, it tends to take on some of the unique characteristics of that place. Most wines do that, but Nebbiolo, like Pinot Noir, does that quite a bit. So having each of these three, I'm not gonna open all three today, but these three side by side would have certain commonalities, but would very have very different profiles at the same time. So because it's a little lighter in color wine, because of the aromatics, I'm going with a Pinot Noir glass for this tasting today. Let's get started. This week's wine is the 2016 Vietti Nebbiolo from the Lange region. Now this is about $28. Believe it or not, that's kind of a good value when it comes to Nebbiolo. The Barolo and the Barbaresco have longer aging requirements. You'll notice this has got the blue DOC designation. This one's got the gold DOCG. This one does as well in the back. They're more expensive. That's just the way it goes. So if you can shell out the money for a Barbaresco or a Barolo, by all means, give one a try, but you need to sit and let those things age. This Barbaresco is a 2010. I have more of these and still don't think they're quite ready. I'm probably pushing it even drinking this 2016 today, but we're going to give it a shot. One of the first things that really stands out and is unique about Nebbiolo for being a bold, structured, high acid, high tannin red wine. It's fairly pale in color. And one of the things that I'm gonna have to show you, so with the swirl here, hopefully you guys can, can kind of see this, there's a little orange brickish tint and color to it. And that's kind of a telltale sign of a Nebbiolo. So if you're ever doing a blind tasting, you see one that doesn't smell aged like this. I haven't got to the smell yet, but this color is a pretty dead giveaway. It, for whatever reason, this kind of oxidizes a little bit more quickly than other wines and gets more of that orange hue. It's perfectly fine. It hasn't gone bad, but it's just a unique characteristic of Nebbiolo. So on the nose, I'm getting some of the quintessential things that you expect from Nebbiolo. Rose jumps out right away. This is a fairly floral red wine. And I'm getting some black licorice, which, man, if you like black licorice, this would be a good one for you. Some pretty bright cherry aromas are coming out as well. 
maybe a little bit of herbs, but I can't quite pinpoint what they are. But yeah, that black licorice and cherry really coming through and that's kind of a fun combination. The wine's also known for having aromas and flavors of tar and I'm not quite getting it right now. If anything, I'd say maybe, you know what it reminds me of like the, uh, you don't see them as much anymore, but the those orange like clay pots that you would do like outdoor plants and it kind of has that clay pot kind of smell, which given the soil in the area makes sense. All right, let's taste it. <laughs> wow, that's a dry wine. Bone dry, uh, high tannins as well, which I totally expected going into it. They're very grippy, just sucking the moisture out of my mouth. But it's not overpowering. It's not, um, sometimes tannins can be harsh. This is pretty soft, um, fine grain tannins, if you will. It's supposed to be a high acid wine as well, and it is, but I'm gonna call this medium plus, not, I'm not going full on high on the acidity. I'm getting a little salivation, some of those sensations, but not over the top. The alcohol is not too hot. This is 14%. I'm going to call it medium high. I'm not getting a whole lot of heat. Um, the body, again, the color sometimes can be a giveaway on the, on the body, not necessarily. In this case, I think the 14% alcohol, rather than being a 15 or a 16, is is keeping the body down a little bit. So I'm gonna call it just a medium bodied wine. These tend to be a little bit more medium plus and I'm guessing those two would be, but we're gonna call it medium on the body. Great flavors coming through. The cherry really pops. The licorice is a little bit harder to detect. It's there, but it's kind of more subtle. It was more prominent on the nose. And overall, this is not a very fruit intense wine. It's kind of a medium intensity, both on the nose and on the palate. This wine just screams food. This is not an easy wine to just sip and drink on its own. I'm even having a hard time talking because like just my, <laughs> my inside of my lips and gums is drying out as I'm talking from the tannins. It needs some food. Uh, the finish on it is pretty good. A Little bit medium to medium plus on the finish, which is great. A um, couple other things coming through. I'm getting a little leather, um, which, you know, some tertiary, some kind of aged components coming through, but I get a little bit of just meatiness to it. Like just reminds me of a steak and I kind of want one to go, go with this. So overall balance is great on this. This is a well-balanced wine. Length of the finish is, is above average, the intensity of it above average. And I'm going to say th there's, there's a fair amount of primary, secondary, tertiary flavors here that I'm going to give this some pretty good points for, for the complexity of it as well. It's not as complex as it gets, but pretty good. So all in all, I'm going to score this seven and a half points out of 10. And when it comes to food and wine pairings, again, what grows together goes together. So you know, when you think of that kind of rustic Italian fare, but kind of the really rich Italian food, so things with a lot of olive oil, things with a lot of butter or cream, any of those aspects is going to go well with this. You need that fattiness, that richness to kind of work together with the tannins. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in the tip of the week, but I'd like any of those, you know, strong, rich, rustic, intense Italian foods to go with this very intense Italian wine. This week, I want to focus on textbook food and wine pairings. These are guidelines. These are just some of the expert opinion rules of thumb to use when pairing food and wine. Don't take these as gospel. They're just good guidelines. Next week, I'll talk a little bit about some more practical advice and maybe some unconventional food and wine pairing things, but these are just some of the basic things that from a fairly scientific standpoint make sense. So first caveat is drink what you like, eat what you like. Don't worry about these. Don't worry about 
you know, oh, I'm having steak, I have to have red wine. If you want white wine with your steak, have white wine with your steak. It's okay, you do you. Secondly, in a video a couple weeks ago on Morvedra, in that tip of the week, I talked about super tasters, average tasters, non-tasters. Your sensitivity level will impact how much these matter. If you're a super taster versus a non-taster, these might be more important than, than not. Third and finally, food impacts wine more than wine impacts food. I will oftentimes pick a bottle of wine and then work my meal around it. That's fine, that's kind of fun, that's how I roll sometimes. But generally speaking, the food flavors are more intense than the wine flavors and they are going to elevate or reduce aspects of the characteristics of the wine. And that's really what some of these pairings are about. So let's start with a couple of old adages that still carry some weight, but again, rules of thumb, you don't have to follow these. Number one, generally speaking, start with your lighter wines and finish with your heavier wines. So if you're having a dinner or a lunch, I'm not judging, if you're having a meal where you're gonna have maybe a glass of wine with one course and another one with a different course or go, you got a big group of people, you're gonna go through a couple, better off to start with the Pinot Grigio and finish with a Cabernet than to flip those. Cabernet first and then immediately chasing it with the Pinot Grigio, the tannins and everything going on in your mouth might prevent you from enjoying a more delicate wine. Secondly, generally speaking, drink young wines and then finish with old wines. And then lastly, you wanna do your dry wines, finish with your sweet wines. And again, that kind of makes sense. That's how you eat dinner. You generally don't have dessert and then finish with your steak. You usually have your steak and then finish with your dessert. Wines tend to be better following that same format. So now I wanna focus on kind of the five main perceptions about our food when it comes to food and wine pairing and how you pair wine with each of those. So for example, if you're having a high acid meal, if you're having a nice classic Italian dish with a lot of tomato sauce that makes it a high acid meal, you wanna have a high acid wine to go with that. And the reason is the acidity in the food is going to reduce the sense of acidity in the wine by comparison. So if you have a very low acid wine with a high acid food, it's gonna take taste even less acidic, and that is gonna make a wine that is low in acid to begin with taste kind of flat and flabby compared to the meal. So you want a high acid wine paired with a high acid food, and it's going to bring the acid down a little bit, but it's still gonna be enough to hold up to the food. Now a big rich steak, all those proteins are gonna to bind to your tongue, your taste buds. What's gonna happen when you have a big bold Cabernet with those high tannins, they're going to essentially, like I described the tannins with the Nebbiolo here as being kind of like fine sandpaper. They're gonna scrub away those protein molecules that stick to your tongue and wash those away. So every time you take a new bite of steak and you take a sip of wine, your wine kind of cleanses your palate and starts anew and the next bite you taste is gonna taste like that first one. So you're gonna just constantly have this great virtuous circle, this loop going by pairing big, bold, meaty umami with a high tannin wine. Steaks also tend to be very well seasoned, oftentimes with a lot of salt. And if you think about the impact salt has on our food, it's gonna kind of do the same thing with wine. So salt is often used to enhance the flavors of a certain food, amplify those flavors, and it tends to tenderize or soften meats. So in much the same way, you wanna pair a salty or salt forward dish with a high tannin wine that's got a lot of fruit because it's gonna soften those tannins and it's gonna amplify that fruit. So again, with a steak, you've got kind of the contrast of umami and salt going together, but both of those work well with a high tannin wine. Now, where it starts to get a little bit tricky is when you get into things like spicy foods. So spicy foods or things that are really cold like ice cream, the heat from the spice or the real cold from ice cream kind of numb or deaden our nerves and our, our taste buds a little bit. So what you wanna do is try to contrast that with something low alcohol. If you're having a spicy, you know, 
Asian fusion dish or curry dish or whatever it may be, you wanna have something that's going to reduce the heat. So a low alcohol wine, because if you've ever had you know, a shot of bourbon, you feel that heat in your throat, spice is going to do that to the wine. It's gonna amplify that alcohol and give you more of that perception of heat. And you've already got a lot of heat in your mouth. So you want low alcohol and potentially a higher sweetness level in your wine. So like the Moscato episode that we just did last week, that Moscato Dosti with low alcohol, high sweetness, higher sweetness levels would go well as a contrast to that. And it's going to, even if you don't like sweet wine, it's gonna lower the sweetness level. That spice is gonna lower it. So you need to start with one that's already higher to begin with. Finally, speaking of sweetness, if you're having a sweet item, if you're having dessert, you wanna pair it with a dessert wine. And most dessert wines like Port and like Sauterne tend to be high in sweetness. Because the sweetness level is so high on your dessert, you want a very high level of sweetness on the wine because again, it's going to reduce the perception of sweetness. So if you start with something with very, very low sweetness, like the Nebbiolo here, or like a Cabernet, you're gonna take it and actually amplify the bitterness because there's not much sweetness to begin with. It's gonna make it more bitter, less fruity, and that's the opposite of what you wanna do. So that's why most desserts are paired well with dessert wines that tend to be higher in sweetness level. So those are some of the basic tips to know when it comes to food and wine pairing. Again, these are just kind of scientifically proven things, but at the end of the day, drink what you like, pair it with what you want, and enjoy it. Thank you for watching another episode of Wine This Week. I hope you enjoyed it. If so, please like and subscribe. Join me next week as we move on to another Italian wine called Nero Dalva. This is a wine I've never had before, kind of shamefully, and I'm excited to give it a try, so please join me next week. Until then, keep trying new wines, and as always, cheers.